speaking of player announcements, gentlemen, we know the Canadian men are, uh, what's, uh, I don't know, whatever. I, don't make me do math. All I we know are is 20 World days Cup away from their Thank first Thank you. Game. 20 days. That's it. <laughs> I'm like, what's the cat? What's the countdown? I don't know. All I know is they kick off November 23rd against Belgium. But here's the thing: before that, they have two friendlies, and we know that November 11th is one of them. It's it's against Bahrain, and we know that this is a big match, gentlemen, for the guys who are not playing right now. A lot of them MLS players, so we're seeing a lot of other players who've been named to this squad who maybe we would not see named to a squad with all the other European-based, you know, Canadian players uh, if they were available. So here's who's going. Uh, to be going to that game November 11th against Bahrain. And, and you can see some names, like, you know, quite a few right away stand, like Lucas McNaughton. To me, that's a name that stands out, right? Jacob Schaffelberg, Io Akinola, Jaden Nelson. Um, and I wonder, I'll start with you, Wheels. Is there anybody on that list who could force themselves onto a World Cup roster who aren't there right now, but suddenly they play out of their skin and maybe, again, because of injuries, we even heard John Herdman speak about it earlier this week, like the Scott Kennedy one just really kind of knocked him over because, you know, it just wasn't the, not the news you want. But is there anyone here who has the potential to say, Herdman, look at me? I don't think so. Um, Herdman used 39 players over the course of qualifying. Those 39 players will make up the squad that goes to Qatar. I, I think that's 99% a lock. Some of these new names coming in, they're filling out the numbers, make an impression for future Canada camps and, you know, work yourself into consideration. That's what that for, that's what they're there for. They're to do their country a service here and help provide meaningful training hours and potential minutes in a friendly. That's going to be essential for the likes of players that are going to be regulars in this Canada side, Johnston, Miller, Lorea, Piet, Kone, like these are the players that you need to focus on. John Herdman was very clear in saying yesterday that this game is about getting those best players on the field and making sure they are as ready as possible to face tier one competition, second ranked in the world, Belgium and a top five world cup contender. That's what it's about. The, all, all the players on the periphery, thank you for doing a service, but your time will come in the future. Yeah, I think it's unlikely. Um, and I certainly think, you know, we, we have to keep our eyes on the, the important thing here, which is, you know, John Herdman said it, 16 or 17 players are, are probably going to play in Qatar. So you're talking about ten or nine or 10 spots at the end of the roster where those players are going to have a role to play in the squads, but they may not see it much, if any time, on, on, on the fields. If, if there's one name that does intrigue me there, and like I say, I don't think it's likely for all the reasons Wheels mentioned that someone new kind of cracks the roster at this stage, but maybe even in the longer term as well, I think Matthew Schwanier is a really good player. And, and I think he's someone who can play kind of anywhere um, on the wing, a wing back in central midfields. That to me is an interesting player who, who you know, if he has an absolutely unbelievable camp, could become a, a potential option just because of his versatility. I, d I do think it's probably too late in the day, though, to, to expect anyone who didn't play some kind of part in qualifying to, to be part of that final 26. All right. Well, both of you mentioned what John Herdman had said, that he's going to rely on 16 to 17 players. We've asked him um, as well throughout the course of these you know, qualifiers and even just now that they've qualified for World Cup, how much rotation we can see in the squad and he really said not much so I want to have a little bit of fun here and I want to get your projected Ooh, core fun. players here so when he says like 16 17 who's he talking about so wheels why don't we start with you who would you believe are the core players here those 16 to 17 that'll see most of the playing time for Canada I think we I think we might throw up not throw up, put up on the screen. <laughs> I, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver and my picks and okay. taking a look at it. Oh. I think that we are I think we got the same ones. completely aligned Wow, on the 16 players for the first the time ever, ladies miracle. and gentlemen. <laughs> but Your some of the players we have, like, different. perhaps in we different positions, same 16, but the, the same yeah. 16 players. And I don't know about you, Ollie. The, the 16th and EK Ugbo, I wasn't a hundred percent sure, but I'm pretty sure right. that, he, that right. he will be the 16 beyond that. I honestly can't see any other player unless desperate times called for desperate measures, actually playing a significant or meaningful role for this Canada side. If we can put that, the, the, the graphic back up, because the one thing that 
Ollie, I believe that it's the case with you. I have no backups playing in the back three. We saw over the course yeah. of the two warm-up matches last window, there was no backup. I think that the backup at that those positions, early center back, is Atiba Hutchinson. Then if you need someone to play on the left-hand side, mm. then Sam Atakubi goes back. Or Richie Larea goes to the right. Like, there's versatility in this squad. It's one of the reasons why they're so strong. You ever, even saw Junior Hoylet playing outside on, on the right fullback position. So there's so much versatility that that's kind of how I think you shuffle the deck rather than bring in new players that might be more suited, at least on paper, to play those positions. By the way, you caught me in how I'm getting, maybe I need glasses too, because I was like this, trying to, <laughs> did, did I, I know, did I see Osorio or not see Osorio, gentlemen? No. Well, that's where I was I was going to go next, was I, I think if there's a 17th, if there's a 17th player, it's Tim. Um, but it's just about, is he ready to go? Uh, so Her Herdman said 16 or 17. I would think that's the 16 plus Azorio that he he probably has in mind. We could be wrong. Obviously, maybe there's someone else sneaking in there, like a, a Derek Cornelius at the back or, or, or someone like that. But I think when you look at, you know, the amount they played in qualifying, you look at form and fitness right now, you look at the club level they're playing at, which is probably why someone like Ugbo's in there, even if he's not had as much exposure uh, in the Canadian team. Those are the 16 that, that pretty obviously stand out, I think. Yeah, the, the other note, Andy, is that Atiba Hutchinson, you know, hasn't been playing. John Herbin's hopeful mm -hmm. that he does get some minutes in a Turkish Cup match in, in the coming weeks. I, I put him in a reserve area, whether it's at central midfield or at the back. I just don't think going into the tournament, he can start games. Like, I think that maximum at the end of the game is 15, perhaps stretch it out to 20 minutes. That's how he's going to have to be utilized. He needs players that are ready to go right now. And that's why these games, I look at the central midfield areas, you know, specifically. Kone and Piet, I think there's a decision to make there about who may fit the bill. I think that Piet, based on experience, his form has been great too, gets the edge in that area. But there's some sorting out to do in that one area specifically. Yeah, and how how... Massive is this November 11th game for a player like Osorio? Uh, because, gentlemen, you can't rush anything that has to do with the head. We've heard players say this so many times when it's a broken bone. I mean, heck, even when it's a ligament, there's a, t a timeline there. When it comes to your head, you just don't know. So how much are you going to be watching Oso on this November 11th game to see how fit he is? Yeah, probably as much as anyone, right? Um, Herdman said yesterday that you know they've been tracking him and they have, they have the data and so on from from training and scrimmages, and that's all positive. And it's, it seems like he's doing well in, in that environment. But you know, going to Qatar and playing a World Cup match is a, is a very different thing. So the, these are the two opportunities he'll get to, to prove that he's ready for that. I, I would say the one thing you can you can vouch for with Azorio is he, he's an intelligent player. He's super fit. Like those things, you don't really have to worry about with him in terms of his ability to transition back to, you know, to first team football quickly, it would just be a case of the tempo of the games, the match speed. Can he get back up to that level having not played much at all over the past few months? Well, and, and, and it's, it's just really quickly. It goes, yeah. the focus is not just having a player come back. It's about having the player come back and ready to play at the highest level. Yeah. And that's the thing, like Osorio simply hasn't played. Neither is Atiba, and I understand that argument. But with Atiba, it just seems like there might be something else. Like, you know, 39, final World Cup, you know, the captain of this team. Osorio was one of the best players for Canada over the course of World Cup qualifying. But missing that last window was huge for him, you know. And, you know, the way that Kone and Piet have played, you know, Eustachio is not coming off the field unless you need to carry him off, literally. So, that just kind of leaves you with some decisions to be made. Yeah, Eustachio's been looking great in Champions League, becoming the seventh all-time Canadian to score in Champions League. What about Kyle Lahren, though, guys? Because I know when they played against Qatar in that friendly in that window in September, he goes and he scores a goal. He hadn't been playing a lot with Club Bruges. They did have a game this week as well. Once again, came off the bench. And if I'm not mistaken, out of the 10 appearances that he's made, I think nine he's come off off the bench. He hasn't been getting a lot of minutes. But I still go back to that game against Qatar. And it's, he didn't look too shabby against Uruguay either. But is there a little bit of, ooh, he's not getting a lot of playing time wheels. And you know, maybe I am a little concerned. Yes, but Herdman was convinced by Laren in that last camp. He said he came in fit as he's ever seen mm -hmm. him. Uh, his coach, 
uh, with Bruges it, it was saying very good things about him as well. It's just a competitive side to get into. This is a side that just advanced in the Champions League. There's real competition for places. So I think it's a number crunch and a numbers game rather than an indictment on Kyle Laren. For me, that port partnership is rock solid with him and Jonathan David up top. What when, when they go from that three box three into like a, a four, four, two Laren and, and David, they just know how to play with one another. He continues to produce for country. That's why for me, uh, he starts this tournament no matter what. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that's where we have one difference. I don't know if we can flash the, the graphic back up again, but I, I do think that if Kyle Laren is, is not playing regularly, which he isn't right now, and it looks like it will be the case until the world cup, it makes it an easier decision to potentially put Buchanan in that front three. Now, B Buchanan's been playing a lot of wing back for Club Bruges, so maybe Herdman's changed on that a little bit um, since the last window. But it seemed like in you know around the Qatar and Uruguay games that his intention was to use Buchanan up top with with Davies and David mm -hmm. and potentially Laren. So that that's one where it's it's a little bit interesting. Do you say because of Laren's lack of minutes? let's keep you on the bench and use you in shorter bursts because that might be more suited to you and get Buchanan in that higher position where he can be, you know, so electric and so dangerous on the break. Or do you say, well, Buchanan's been playing wing back at Champions League level and there's still potentially a bit of a hole at wing back with Lorea, not playing much for TFC. Hoylet, that's still a new position to him. That I think is, is an interesting debate to have as, as to where you put Sejong. I think we said this months ago on the show that we could probably name 10 of the starters. Like that's, that's yeah. the one position down that right side, that right wing back and that right side attacking player in the front three, who's that going to be? Cause Laren has a case, Buchanan has a case up top or in behind. he's going to be starting no matter what. D do you play junior Hoylet in behind? He's played, you know, it's a new position for him, but he's been playing there for Reading all season long. He's had a very good season. Mm -hmm. So he can play in that role and push Buchanan forward if you want to take Laren out. That's the one wrinkle. That's the one big decision, big call, other than central midfield, that John Herdman needs to make. So you know that no stone is left unturned when it comes to Herdman. And here we are, you know, analyzing who's going to be in the starting 11 and who could come in off the bench. But what about the support players. And I don't want to make an assumption that they're not going to see any time because we just don't know what's going to happen at the World Cup. But quickly, as we end off here, I just think of a player like Daniil Henry, who he has been singing his praises, how valuable it is to have somebody like that, Ollie, still part of your squad. Yeah, I think if you heard the answer that Herdman gave about Daniil Henry in, in the press conference yesterday, you, you can probably safely say that he's going to be on the plane to Qatar despite the lack of games he's played recently. And and, and I think Herdman, you know, did a did a pretty eloquent job of explaining why he's he's a player who's an important leader in that group. He's a player who, you know, before big games, I think has the ability to maybe calm guys down and get them in the right frame of mind. He is an experienced player himself. Remember, like this is a guy who's who's been over in Europe and played at a high level. Um, and also in terms of facing some of the players, the types of players they're going to be going up against. I think there's some wisdom there from Daniel Henry that, again, he can share with with younger defenders and and, and help prepare them for those games. So, uh, again, go back and listen to that answer. It's, it's on our YouTube channel if, if you'd like to. Um, but it's clear that Herdman holds Henry in, in massive regard in terms of the off-field impact he can have, even if he's unlikely to play. Andy, I think if we're going to talk about that 17th player, whether it's Osorio could end up being Daniel Henry as well. Uh, honestly, because Scott Kennedy going out, I would have had him as part of the 17. I think that he would have been the backup center back in yeah. most likely every scenario. Does that open the window, the door for a Daniel Henry to come in? Who's played big games, played Jamaica away, played against the United States. Um, there's trust and he's a leader in this group and he could very well, I think it's an outside chance, but I think he could very well find himself on the field in Qatar.